Hello, I'm Robert Massey, General Director of the Opera Festival of Chicago. Welcome to this presentation of our monthly 1221 digital series. In this episode, Festival Artistic Director Ella Marchment leads a series of conversations with three dynamic opera conductors, Valentina Pelegi, Julia Jones, and Jennifer Condon. This presentation is made possible thanks to donor support, and we wish to express our deepest gratitude to all our contributors. For information on how you could join us in bringing live Italian opera to Chicago and beyond, please visit our website, www.operafestivalchicago.org. Now I'm delighted to turn it over to Ella. Tonight at Opera Festival of Chicago, we are delighted to be joined by Valentina Pelagi. She's currently at the Richmond Symphony Orchestra, leading as their new music director. Um, Valentina is a leading conductor of her generation and was also a trailblazer as a female conductor. She was the first woman uh, to enter the conducting program at the Royal Academy of Music and is a huge role model for female performers. Um, she has also led orchestras around the world, uh, including the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, BBC National Orchestra of Wales and Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Um, her, her career straddles both sides of the Atlantic, where she was the English National Opera Macarius Fellow and conducted Carmen Bohem Orpheus in the Underworld and Dido and Aeneas with them. Um, she has a, a brilliant schedule upcoming and she's also the guest music director of uh, Teatro São Pedro in Brazil. So welcome Valentina and first of all um, we're so delighted to have you here and could you just tell us a little bit first of all about how you got into conducting and, and why you love why you love doing this. Hi Ella, hi everybody. I'm so happy to be with you and thank you for having me. Um, music has always been part of my life and uh, singing has always been so I think everything that I've um, that I've touched as a, as a conductor has always been moved from from a great passion for singing and for singers um, and that's why I'm so you know that's my three areas that I split my my time are symphonic orchestra symphonic repertoire opera and a cappella choir. There is something about the breath and the lines and the phrasing that has always um, amazed me. And that's why probably I'm so, I'm such a fan of bel canto because that's, that's all about it. So singing is just, I think, everybody can relate to sing, right? And that's what you're looking for also in, in, an, in, an, in a symphonic repertoire, just the, the breath, the, the phrasing, playing as you, as you were singing. And uh, I, have a, I have a very crazy story about that in my past, in my ancestors, because uh, my family, um, I don't have you know, parents who are musicians uh, or relatives that are uh, musicians, but I have a very strange story with my great great grandmother. Uh, so she she uh, was born in Rome. That was beginning of last century, and uh, from a very nice family and healthy. So um, as all the as all the young girls in the you know in the middle society in the good society, she received an education. Uh, so she learned how to um, sing and how to play as part of her education, right? But nobody expected from her to be to become a musician for a profession. But she loved it, and she had a wonderful voice, a wonderful something like a special, and um, and she adored singing. So once she she heard that in in Rome there were some auditions for Bohem. Uh, and and Puccini was in, in the panel, so she she wow. was okay. This is the this is the time of my life. I mean, I that's the opportunity. So she was just so enthusiastic. She ran into the auditions. She sang her out her her out, and uh, and she won. She was selected to sing uh, Musetta in in one of the first you know performances in in Rome. And uh, so she, she was so excited, she came back home 
and she told her family that she won the audition. And then, you know, reality struck her because um, at that time, uh, you know, she was engaged to, um, to a member, to an official of the Navy. And at that time for marrying, you know, um, you needed a, an approval from, you know, the, your, from your, you know, your chief. And uh, sing and marrying a, a singer or a musician wasn't, uh, wasn't an option. So her, um, <clears throat> her family said, you know, you can marry, but if you marry, uh, you know, you have to, you know, just give up singing and you can, you can sing, but if you sing, you cannot marry. So that wasn't actually a, a choice. Of course, she married, she never sang again. I met her when uh, I was, uh, I don't know, 11, 12, and she was more than 95, 96. But I remember she was all dressed up. And I remember her playing the piano with, and the, you know, the, um, the nails, you know, hitting the, because of course you had to have, you know, long nails as a, as a, as a, as a lady. But, and she was all dressed up with all these, you know, things here on the neck, you know, in velvet, um, as, she, as she had to be on stage. And she was playing on the piano, all the Puccini arias, but never, never sang, only playing. And these, I didn't know about this story. When she passed, my grandmother told me about that. And uh, I, was, I was very, I mean, shocked because uh, that was their passion. And... Uh, just because she was born in a moment, in a time that wasn't possible. She had these, you know, all her life. And I, I felt very moved because uh, luckily I'm in a, I was born in a different period where, you know, of course it's still difficult, but there, is, there are chances. And following your dreams, following your, you know, what your inspirations and it's still possible. So, yeah. That's my story with music, and that's how I, I feel a responsibility, you know, in it. Well, wow, that's such a beautiful thing, and also it feels like you're sort of living on the the dreams of that that weren't possible in another place and another time. Um, following on from that, actually, um, specifically being a female um, conductor and a role model to others, how how do we make sure that more women are succeeding in this career path and encouraging them to to follow the, their hearts? I think this is very, it's a very challenging point and very important to raise because, uh, uh, of course, the first step is opening up possibilities, but but it's very important to offer tools, not only open doors. It's not enough because uh, I see that you know the numbers of uh, women conductors in the schools, like in academies, are growing. But then, what happens after you finish? Then there is a there is a huge gap. And uh, I, I, am, I am very pleased in seeing that, you know, doors are slowly opening, but I, am, I want to make sure that this is not a, a fashion. This is something that worries me. And the only, the only way we, I think, we can guarantee that this is something that really stays and really deep is control the quality. And you, you know, the only way is just giving tools for, for real so that, you know, it's conducting is a very complex, very, very complex um, job. First, because it's not a job. Uh, there are good conductors and bad conductors and they are, you know, both in male and female, you know, conductors. It's just, you know, good person, good, you know, people that can do the job and people that can, cannot. Um, so I think quality is always the is always the answer. Offering tools. And that's a really interesting thing, actually, following from quality about the way that people relate to an orchestra. And obviously, you're dealing with a vast amount of people all the time, and different people on different projects. And managing people is always a challenge of the job. Um, and obviously, there, especially knowing some of the German traditions where it can be quite um, dictatorial as well. And leadership is changing and leadership skills are changing at the moment. So how, how does a conductor um, work with an orchestra now? And how do you communicate with the, with the different players that you're working with? Yeah, you said, you said something very important, leadership. Um, leadership is something that uh, each one of us has to shape 
accordingly to um, the society we live in, but also our own character. So, of course, there were conductors in the past, and I'm just talking about Toscanini just because it's, you know, it's, it's right here behind my back, right? Um, and, and he, as other colleagues, of course, of his, um, did things that, I don't know, that could be in jail very, very quickly at this time, you know? But um, that was a complete different society. That was a complete different world, uh, completely just, just so different. I mean, I, and in some ways, you know, I'm glad we moved on. Um, especially for a woman that steps in, in this kind of world of conducting, it is very important that we find our own way uh, in leadership. Um, each one, I think, has, uh, you know, her own replies. Um, my way to think it is just, you know, what is, in the end, what is that a conductor does? Uh, what we do, what is our goal? I think my goal as a conductor is to enable the players to, to play at the best they can, always. Rehearsals and concert to allow the singer to sing at their best and allow the audience to have the best experience ever. Uh, at the same time, you know, allowing the composer to, to be through to the composer. Um, but at the same time, trying to be realistic, you know, trying to be uh, not in, a, in an old box. You know, just because it's written like this, and so we have to play, there's a very fine balance. So there are a lot of moving parts. That's a really interesting point as well that you're saying, because obviously our professor in Chicago, we're about performing kind of the Italian greats, but also trying to expand the, the repertoire that's coming to public knowledge. Um, and obviously you've done a lot of Italian music and obviously being your background yourself. Um, how do you think Italian opera that that is, 200, 300 years old can be relevant to modern audiences now? Well, this is something, this is a question that is not only about Italian opera, it can be any opera, any, opera. any masterworks. I mean, how can be, I don't know, uh, a piece of literature written, a Greek tragedy? How can, I don't know, uh, something that has been written centuries ago can be still actual? Um, and real in these days. I think it's the same thing. Um, there, is, uh, there is something in these masterworks that is immortal. And sometimes it's not even the, the story, the plot. Most of the stories in you know, these, all these operas, but also in some uh, literature masterworks are, are really, they give, they offer the opportunity to reflect on some themes and topics that are really deep, important, but the stories in themselves, they're just superficial, right? But that's not important because they touch um, issues that relate to humanity, you know, regardless to the time we live. And so they will always be actual. And the artistry is how they are built, how they are told is much more important than what they actually, the story, the, the way they are built, the way, for example, Verdi is shaping his characters. I mean, that's the, that's the only, probably, it's the only um, composer that shaped women characters so strong. And, you know, that's, you know, the stories are, you know, just, they just happen. But in the story, you, you see these figures, these characters, they're just so... I don't know, there is a strength in them that I've never seen in any other opera. Of course, Rossini, this is, this is a different kind of, you know, brio in, in, in the female uh, roles, but, but Verdi, I mean, is something absolutely different. And the way a composer shapes the character with sounds, it's just a man, sometimes it's drawing a melody, but the melody has has a has a power. It's like uh, I don't know. It's like uh, an architecture. It's like stones. It's like uh, it's phenomenal. Or sometimes if the composer offer, you know, a, a palette of sound 
that you know then then you know sometimes it's just enough noble together with uh, a double basis that gives you the impression of you know, something so present and you know the, the oboe sound is so narrow so present so almost here and then the bass is something that dark and so there are the artistry in building up these things that are just marvelous i love this way that you're talking about it so pic pictorially as well so for example if you were conducting verdi opposed to mozart or rossini they're all very very different people but how how would you approach the actual conducting process and, and getting to know the music for those? You mean while I'm conducting or the work that I do before? In, in both, both the preparation and how you communicate once you're in the rehearsal environment. How does it change between different composers? Well, each composer is a different universe. It's like, and sometimes, uh, in you know, same uh, different operas by the same composer in different times that has been written they are really really different um i don't think i would change my approach uh but the result for sure i mean knowing that a specific composer has um a different vision of singing the different vision of you know what what is he or she looking for what is what is that is important in this moment uh, i think that's 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 essential and at the same time it, you said you know how do you communicate that's very that's very um subtle because we conductors don't play right but we have to communicate and uh, most of the time rehearsal schedule is just so uh, tight that you know you can work with singers and there is time for doing that allowing you know before the re the rehearsals with the orchestra but from the moment you start your um, rehearsing together, you know, the staging rehearsal with orchestra and singers, um, you, it's really, you know, if you stop it, it means that it's something really, really important. So you always try to communicate with, uh, with your players and your singers without stopping. That means without talking because you know singers are just so far on stage and then you know and we're all you know busy playing other notes it's just you cannot talk but but there are so many other ways to communicate and that's where your body language is is so essential and and has to be efficient amazing um thinking about the body language and the, the distance as well between when you've got an opera an opera and then a symphony how how do you adjust between the the two of them and how how also do you balance your conducting career and your different engagements between these and obviously you said the a cappella is obviously a big side of um your output as well which i think is makes you very very unique as well well from the from the Jester's point of view, there is something very basic that stays, right? And so, so the, the scheme um, is similar. That said, everything changes. But that changes also if you have, you know, if you're conducting a string orchestra or, or, a, or a brass ensemble. I mean, it, your conducting is, is so connected with the players you are playing because it's, con it's connected with the sound. And each instrument has a different, well, first, uh, they react differently to the sound. There are some instruments that, you know, just for the nature, they, they have an immediate production of the sound. Some instruments, they just, you know, are. So that's, that influence the conducting. And because the conducting has to, you know, has to be the voice of the, uh, of the instrument and the same thing with the with the with the voices with this with the singers or with the choirs it's just you know conducting is this is the shape of the sound is the visual of the sound how you how you conduct how you just it's it's it will it's not a reflection of the sound it's the producing of the sound so although the schemes are are the same you know the the soul of it is completely different well you're making me think of conducting like a sculptor of sound right now it's such but a it's true it's true whatever arts are just one thing they're just you know each they're just different sides of the same coin and that's the same the coin is the humanity so is there different expressions of, of who we are 
And, and it's so important to be connected with humans because in the end, what I was talking about breath, that's all in there. You know, the first, what, what makes, you know, what has in common conducting with all these instruments is breathing. The, before even playing, you know, the first upbeat, it really, then it changes, it can be fast, it can be slow and deep, I mean, you know, that changed from the instruments, each instrument is different, but the idea behind the breath is what is common with, you know, each instrument and each arts. I love the importance that you have in the breath as well, because obviously that trans it just transfer it goes across all all playing, all performing, and all music. Um, it's been so inspirational to talk to you, and thank you so much for giving your time kindly to to this. And we, we hope to be seeing a lot more of you soon. Uh, and also, um, can we just leave with one final question, which actually is not so much a question but some advice? Um, at the Opera Festival of Chicago, our mission is to give voice and to rediscover great masterworks that have not been widely performed, especially in America. There seems to be a kind of circulation of perhaps Bohems, Barbara Seville's, quite a narrow amount of Italian opera is actually making its way over to the States. Um, so how would you suggest a young company like ours does to make, what, what can we do to make the public realize that there is a lot of beautiful operas out there and that actually that there's, much more for people to kind of get their teeth into well i'm so i'm so excited i'm so pleased i mean this is a wonderful project and uh, it's it's so essential i mean it's something that you know we were missing so uh, there is a lot there are a lot of scores that you know are less performed than others and sometimes you know it's just a matter of you know, just let, we have to do them man, because they're so precious, and especially in the Italian repertoire and the bel canto. I mean, so, so many scores and so precious and elegant. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I would say, you know, quality, when we put quality first, uh, that's only the way to go. Brilliant, thank you. I've just got one more thing, actually. If you had the opportunity to have supper with an Italian composer, who would you choose? Verdi. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> I think I'm with you. <laughs> we can fight over him for supper. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so, so much, Valentina. Thank you, Ella. Such a pleasure talking to you. Julia Jones is a British conductor and music director for Opera and Symphony Orchestra of uh, Wuppertal since 2016. She's renowned for her innovative programming that combines both old and new music and is widely respected worldwide. You might have seen her conducting at Welsh National Opera, the Grand Theatre in Bordeaux, the Royal Opera House, or even the Salzburg Festival, just to name a few. Julia has also conducted our very own festival president, Franco Camponi, in Donizetti's Le Lise d'Amour at Opera Nationale du Rhin in 2016. So Julia, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us about um, conducting. I am a director myself and I'm always fascinated, first of all, like with the relationship between directors and conductors, text and music. Um, and especially for, for me growing up as well, I didn't particularly know that many female figures in the industry. And obviously you have been a real trailblazer in, in many respects. Um, how, how can we make sure that more women are succeeding and, and taking steps in this career path, first of all? Well, it's not something you can, you know, put a figure on and say, you know, it, it's not as, not as easy as that. The only way, firstly, everybody, each person, each woman who comes and makes sure for herself that she is well prepared, she's doing a good job, that she's, you know, just to being accepted and just, you know, as I, I've been convincing. You have to be convincing about what you do. It's not about yourself. It's the way you create music with musicians, singers, etc. cetera. So that, that is, the, is the first step for each individual person. And then what we can all do to help those women now joining and wanting to do conducting is to support them and to give them opportunities. Because whether you're a male or female, I mean, you know, if you're a young tenor, you need a break. You need somebody to hear you and say, wow, he's good. And some, you know, oh, I can recommend him. And you know what I mean? You need, so you need to help, help the process a bit, but that only works with people who really 
especially in conducting, I mean, know what they're doing. I mean, really, really are well prepared. Otherwise, it doesn't matter what gender you are. You won't get further because every musician in every orchestra, I mean, professional orchestra, they know immediately if the conductor is on top of what they're doing and knows the music and has learned the score. And that, that actually follows me very nicely to our next question as well about knowing the score and working with an orchestra. What's the difference, the biggest difference for you between conducting an orchestra alone compared to an opera orchestra where obviously there's these two different levels and the orchestra are now in the pit? Mm, yeah, there, there is a big difference. One would say, but why is it just an orchestra? Because as you know, it's not just an orchestra. I mean, when you're, when you're in the symphony, I have a symphony concert this week in Wuppertal. And so we're just concentrating on our work, our job. And when we get on stage, it's just us, it's the musicians and me doing Beethoven or Mozart or Schubert or whatever. And um, the whole focus is on that. Whereas when the orchestra is in the pit, the conductor has to communicate between the pit and the singers on stage, the chorus on stage. There are many technical things going on with um, uh, entrances, people leaving the stage. Um, all kinds of things you have to think about. There's lights, there's costumes. I mean, it's all is, is incorporated into this one big thing, which we call one big event, I would say these days, which is called opera. And um, that is different because you can't have all your attention by the orchestra. If, you know, the, the musicians are below you. If you're looking down at the musicians, communicating just with them, that's not helping the singers at all. You need to be with the singers. You need to support the singers on stage. That, brilliant, thank you. And I, actually this follows on to something quite interesting because obviously I'm, I'm from a uh, theatre and opera background yet trained as a musician and actually I find it quite a different change of gear when I go between theatre and opera because of the way that the relationship between a conductor and a director works and there's essentially kind of more cooks in the room and I, I really love the collaborative element of it. How would you describe the, the relationship between these different forces working within the rehearsal room? Yeah, well, you know, if you have a good director who understands something from music, um, doesn't, you don't, people say, oh, the director has to know the score and all this. It's not actually true. I mean, I've worked with directors, many directors who did their first ever opera with me, and these are very, very well-known directors now. And, um, but they have an instinct for the music, so they don't have to be able to read music. If a director can read music, it can help, because you can point in the score and say, look, this and this and this. Normally it's the conductor pointing in the score and trying to work with the director to, you know, find a, find, find a way of doing things or trying to get the right colors. I think it's more about colors often and how you say things, how you don't say things. Um, when you are directing a play, you can, you have the text, but you don't have anything else like uh, controlling how you interpret the test, you can, you're probably very, very free to do that. But we do have the notes. I mean, we do have it black on white. So we do have when it's slow, when it's faster, uh, when it's loud, when it's soft, just to be basic. That's all from the composer. It's my job as a conductor to represent the composer who is in most cases, of course, no longer with us. So, I mean, it's, it's a case of, you know, of speaking to the director, finding good images. I mean, I, I like to do that a lot. That's one of the reasons I love working in opera is to have a good connection with that director and you can come up with many, many good things. And often things which really help the singers on stage. Oh, beautiful. I can imagine it's sometimes quite a shock as well when you get into a new production and you know, you've been thinking about the music in a certain way and then there's a completely different concept or idea introduced to a piece. And, and how, how do you sometimes reconcile that in the rehearsal room context? Well, that, that doesn't happen to me because um, I always meet the, the director before, many months before, you know, it can be even one year before you go through the piece, go through his ideas. Sometimes you need to sort out which part of the opera has to be cut if it's too long or not. I mean, I don't, I've never had the situation where I, I find out about it in the first rehearsal, so I can't really answer that question. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. Um, so turning to obviously what the Opera Festival of Chicago is about, we are dedicated to bringing a wider range of Italian opera to American audiences. There tends to be, um, the, there's a bit of a trend at the moment that the, there's a kind of quite small circle of Rossini and Verdi that's produced and we're seeking to try and expand that. Um, what would you say the, the differences are between conducting someone like Verdi opposed to Mozart? 
what Ashley in, in actually conducting something, there's, there's no difference at all. Oh, I think I think you mean I mean the the approach to to yeah to representing the score once again you know you but it's also how do you do Mozart first of course the notes are different it was written a different period actual conducting doesn't change it's, I mean actual conducting is very very basic you just have to conduct in two or four or three or six I don't know so that's that's really nothing to do with it but interesting is the is to be authentic in the style. So, you know, um, when I'm conducting Mozart, I have to inform myself about the style, how people, how Mozart orchestras played at the time, or what we've learned in the last 30, 40 years, starting with Nicholas Hanenko, of course, um, you know, from, I mean, to be thinking about how things were played instead of just playing it how we think they should be played now with our instruments, everything has changed so much. With Rossini, you need to, you need to understand the form of bel canto. You need to understand that the orchestra is very much just a very, very straightforward, simple structural um, accompaniment or the support to the singer. Yeah, you, you need to be well, in, yeah, well informed in the style, you need to know what you're doing and you need to make, you read the score, you need to read the score, you can't do, you, there are some conductors who do their version of Otello, for example, by Verdi, they, you know, they literally exaggerate everything on the page or change it to completely different tempos that are suggested or required by the um, composer. And, but I, I don't believe in that. I think first, you know, if, if we didn't have the score, if you as a director didn't have the music in front of you, you would be without a job. Yeah, you'd be out of work. And it's yeah. So I'm already have the privilege and the luxury of being given this before. This also somebody has made this for me, the Beethoven, the Mozart, then Verdi, Rossini, you know, Mahler, whatever, going to modern times. So, you know, we, we, it's our job to, to be true to, to that. Brilliant. And I guess it's, it's the ingredients in a way are, always, are there for us. And it's about trying to bring that recipe to life in a, in a kind of in the simplest form. Um, thinking about that, obviously, about honouring the, the work that these composers have written, but yet now can't necessarily communicate to us. And maybe sometimes during the different versions, things get changed and altered and adapted. How then do you think that Italian opera can be relevant to modern audiences? Well, it's, um, I think the relevance, I mean, we're talking, it's about emotion, isn't it, really? The whole thing is about um, things like love and hope and longing and desire. Then it's about war and peace. Then it's about anxiety, fear, struggle, death, jealousy. I mean, it's, um, there are so many different emotions and these are constant with every human being. We, we've all experienced these uh, emotions. So um, I think that it's very relevant because these bel canto Italian stars, they're basically, that's what they're full of. Of course, they go a little bit further than most of us would do because, you know, people get pushed off cliffs or jump off <laughs> Tourette's or whatever, um, you know, so it's, uh, but on the other hand, you know, the, the emotion behind it is so important. And I think that uh, seeing a good production is is um, is is can can really really help a production which um, not you don't have to stay in the past in the sense that many um, operas many people especially younger people they think oh that's uh, opera is so old fashioned we never go and see an opera because it's old fashioned it's for old people you know it's for, or it's just for classical music where they you know they can't know the relevance of those emotions from 12, 300, 1200, 1300, 1400, whatever, from all this, um, all a long time ago, even from Mozart, from the, from the 18th century, they cannot realize uh, how much that actually relates to their own lives unless you're educated about it. So then we get to the education thing, because I mean, you know, opera should be available for everybody. It should be financially possible for any child with its parents who, who maybe don't have the money to spend on, on you know expensive tickets but to be able to to be in programs where they can go and see an opera and where they can choose for themselves whether they want to do that again or not yeah very true very good point and you know it, it's, so, it's so widespread isn't it um i have a question from our, our musical director emanuele andrizzi who said, um, we were talking about Le Lezere as well. And he said, do you, do you ever consider, I think this is an experience that he's had. He said, do you ever consider Nemorino playing the bassoon before the aria or have had experience of that? 
I've never had the experience that, no, and I've never thought about it. I mean, he, he, is he meaning that on stage that Nemorino? Yeah, I think he's had an experience of one Nemorino that, that's offered to play the bassoon before singing that huge aria. Yes. Well, one has to be very careful with this kind of thing. I mean, if he plays beautiful bassoon, maybe it can be really nice, but I mean, some people, you know, not all singers play brilliant instruments as all well, as a brilliantly instrument. So uh, I really am not sure about that. I personally don't think that Elysia needs the added option of the singer playing the bassoon. I think it's <laughs> actually quite nice without it. I think it's, you know, the orchestra bassoon players usually really really very good yeah, yeah, and yeah. we should probably probably leave that with with him or her <laughs> so fair of hands um and yeah i've just got to ask you one more question as well and which is uh, is there anything that you haven't conducted at the moment in italian repertoire that you'd absolutely love to do or or think is a really important piece that should be done more often oh well, that's two things i mean yes there are two then there are two answers because I have never conducted Lucia de Lammermoor and I've always wanted to do it. Wow. And I did have a contract once to do it um, many, many years ago in Hamburg, at the State Theatre in Hamburg. And uh, unfortunately, I moved house uh, a couple of weeks before that contract started and I damaged my back so badly that I couldn't walk for like many, many weeks. So good advice, don't move house two weeks before you... <laughs> Oh, really no. want to conduct an opera that you've never done before. Don't do that. So unfortunately, I didn't get to do it. And there's other pieces by, I mean, by Verdi, for example, um, Zeman Boko Negra, or, um, you know, I've, I've, done a, I've done a lot of the Verdi pieces. I think the early Verdi's are great, and Nani and Attila. There, there are many pieces which one could do. I, I'm lucky because I've done really so many operas that, I, that I've wanted to do, and I've actually been able to do them. So, um, but uh, certainly Lucia would be, would be one of them. Fingers crossed then, that that well, one comes up again in the future. I'm not moving house again. <laughs> Especially if there's a Lucia. No, on, I'm on not moving at all. I'm not leaving the apartment until... <laughs> <laughs> Staying tip top health. Um, and also just finally to, to round things off as well, obviously we're a very young company and we're, we're just making our first strides at the moment. Um, how, what would you advise, this is not so much a question, how would you advise us in, in a way to make the public realise that there is more uh, to Italian opera than Boheme and, and Figaro? How, what, what would you say to us in terms of how we're presenting ourselves and persuading people to come and see our shows? Yeah, I don't, well, I think it's a great idea what you're all doing. I think it's wonderful and what Franco has set up. And I mean, it, it's really, really a great idea. And I think that, you know, you don't have the luxury of being uh, subsidized, by the, subsidized by the state in, um, in, in, in the States, in America, uh, where we have here in Germany. So we can often put on things and say, okay, now this is what you're going to watch. So... I think it would, it's a very good idea to mix things. I mean, to say, okay, this is, if, if you're doing two or three seasons in, two, sorry, two or three operas in one season, I don't know how many you're planning, but it's always good. My, my experience, I've conducted quite a few things in the States. I have one thing which is out there, you know, the Magic Fruit or Bohème or um, Tosca or something, because people know and they want to go. But then, you know, if you can offer them maybe combining a, a kind of ticket system, so whereas they get to see the, piece they know and love as well as something they don't know as much it's a bit like going to a going to a restaurant a very good restaurant or you know suddenly somebody cooking something fantastic and you look at it and you think mm, I've never had that I don't know if I like it but if you never try it <laughs> how are you gonna know and if you try it and you think wow that's amazing so I think it has to be you know you have to link your favorite pasta dish with something else after that you're not sure about and then have a go at it. I, I love the food analogy. It's very fitting for the Italian culture and, and dining yeah, exactly. and the entertainment that we're trying to offer. It's very, very important. It's very important. <laughs> right, thank you so much, Julia, for your time and uh, taking some time yeah. out of your busy schedule. And we really, really appreciate it. Jennifer Condon is an Australian conductor based in Europe. She has a long-standing relationship with Hamburg State Opera and her operatic experience is multivaried and includes over 65 different works. 
she was one of the first six conductors chosen from an international cohort to, to participate in the Dallas Opera's inaugural Heart Institute for Women Conductors back in 2015. Um, most recently, Jennifer conducted the Flying Dutchman at Mono Opera. Welcome, Jennifer, and thank you so much for giving your time to the festival and to talk about the, the role of the conductor. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's wonderful to see you. So starting off, obviously, um, this, this whole programme that we're doing at the moment is about um, female conductors. And, and for me, a big question as well, because I was too, I'm a director, but I was also interested in conducting growing up, but I felt like partially there weren't that many role models or people that I could, I could particularly look up to or find inspiration from. How, how do we make sure that there are more women succeeding in this career path and how can we encourage them to, to follow and pursue conducting? Um, I think actually it's very largely up to those of us already in the industry. Uh, there is not really enough of the concept of women helping women. Um, there's quite a lot of lip service to it, but when it actually comes to it saying, no, here is somebody who can do it, she will do it better than the boys, um, trust it. Uh, I think for most conductors, getting that first chance to really show what you can do is almost impossible unless there's someone helping you and there's someone saying, yes, I know that she hasn't done it before, but she can do it, trust it give her the chance, shine. And I think the more we can do that, um, coming right through for generations and generations, the more chance we have. Really, and that's a really interesting point actually, because also we've seen conducting as quite a gendered thing historically looking back as well. So, and also in terms of the way that, that a conductor rehearses, it's, it's, the orchestra is quite a political body in many ways. How? How does a conductor, how do you think conducting has really changed in recent years? And also how then does a conductor command respect from an orchestra and how do you communicate to an orchestra nowadays? I don't necessarily think it has changed that much. Again, I think there's a perception that uh, it has changed, but I don't actually think that's uh, the fact. You still feel very much when you walk into a room, uh, you feel that you are a woman. It's absolutely undeniable. I've been to auditions where, as I've been walking to the podium, you can hear the orchestra saying, oh, look, a woman, because you've been the only one on the day or even in the entire cohort. Uh, I've been given auditions simply because houses have thought that they should have a woman in the audition. Apparently, it's been the case that they've always known that they weren't going to give the job to a woman, but they wanted to have one in there just to show, oh, no, we had, we had one in the audition process. So I've been the token woman in an audition process a couple of times, and you know, you can feel it as you enter the room. So I don't think there has been a whole lot of, of difference there. Um, how you command respect uh, as a conductor is absolutely is knowing your stuff, knowing your music, knowing... I mean, obviously everyone in the orchestra has extraordinary talents and a phenomenal amount of experience, some more than others, um, but it, it really is, if you know what you want, you know the music, you know what the composer's trying to say, you understand how the music works, particularly in opera, if you understand your role in supporting the stage uh, and what you need to provide uh, that you, it's not just you on your own leading it, that you, it really is a, a helping role um, and a, as a facilitator. I think if you walk in and that is clear and you can show that, then the respect will be there automatically. Right, and that, that leads me on to my next point, actually, which is um, conducting an orchestra alone versus conducting an opera orchestra. Obviously, there is the pit, but what are the main differences and how do you adjust the way that you work? The, it's, I, I personally believe it's much, much easier to go from opera to symphonic conducting rather than the other way around. Very, very many symphonic conductors uh, head to the pit and you can tell when, when they haven't had that much experience with singers. It's the theatre. It's all about the story. It's all about, as I said, facilitation. In, in operatic conducting, the orchestra is... The, it, it's the illustration of what needs to happen. You need to support the atmosphere, the colors, the emotions. You need to underlie everything that's happening on stage, make it work for each individual singer, 
make it work the production and what is being presented on stage, but still have it true to the composer and a coherent whole. So it's pulling together all of these different threads and making it work uh, into something coherent and emotive and to allow the orchestra and the singers to tell the story. If you don't understand singers and singing, you do not belong in the pit. It's as simple as that. Um, and I think a lot of people would find that a harsh statement, um, but having spent almost all my life at an opera house uh, and watched a lot of symphonic conductors, I spent six years in the Hamburg State Opera prop box, watching a lot of people standing behind me who were new to opera. And they were some of the most amazing symphonic conductors but they hadn't figured out this beast that is opera. And, uh, and it really makes an enormous difference and it can be incredibly detrimental for the entire performance. Uh, so yes, I think anyone looking to go into operatic conducting, it's a completely different discipline. And of course you need all your orchestral work. Uh, I've spent lockdown here. The first thing I did was hire a cello, a, a viola and a violin uh, because I haven't done a whole lot of string work. And I had a fantastic experience assisting Jack van Sweden recently uh, with a, a Valkyra and of course with a violinist like that and spending a lot of time talking to him about bowing. I thought, right, I need to learn more actually how it feels in my hands. I'd learned the theory, but I want to try and see what it feels like. Uh, so not necessarily to play, um, but just to, to understand. And it's, it's been a huge a huge advantage, I think. I've actually been glad to have the time to spend doing that. Um, and so those skills are absolutely necessary. But if you don't appreciate, love and understand singers, singing and the theatre, get out of the pit. <laughs> awesome. I think that's amazing that you've actually gone so far to get these instruments and really be, really be kind of immersing yourself in their world to understand it more. I think that's a really beautiful thing to do do um also then moving towards singers as well and singing how how would you advise people to rehearse with singers then listen to them listen very carefully watch uh, singers will show almost everything they are intending to do subconsciously while they're singing in their breath in their eyes in their body language if you observe everything and open a discussion you'll find out what support they need uh, how you can enhance them find out how they see their character um, it, it's it's not really helpful conducting a piece exactly as you see f see it and you've heard it in your head if the singer that you have is uh, young and not quite up to the broad tempo that you hear in your head for perhaps an older singer or uh, here's something differently or has, has a different personal experience that changes the way they think about the character. Um, it may make a difference to some of the colours that you need to work with. Uh, I had a fantastic experience and learned a lot from this. Uh, I did a recording of Peggy Glanville Hicks, uh, an Australian composer, wrote an opera for Maria Callas in 1963. And it got lost. And uh, I recorded the uh, world premiere of it in 2012 with an absolutely gorgeous cast uh, of singers, one of whom was Sir John Tomlinson. Uh, and I was quite young doing this recording and it was my first recording experience. And uh, I had spent 12 years at this point working on the score of the opera. I took the score from manuscript. Oh right through. So I had lived with this. A lot of people say that I've spent more time with, with the character of, of Sappho, or the title character, than I have with any of my actual friends. Um, so I, I really, I really lived this piece. It was in my bones. I dreamt it for 12 years. That was, uh, and so I had very, very clear ideas of how I heard it and how I felt it. And uh, there's a beautiful scene sung by Sir John, uh, that is the story of an old man. And the first time we got into rehearsal, uh, we walked through it and I realized we had absolutely completely different ideas of what it should be. And whilst some of my thoughts needed to come in to retain the arc within the opera, so the, the musical structure of it, uh, I realized very quickly that John was right. 
simply because it, this was an old man story. Um, and I hope John will forgive me for calling him an old man in an interview, but c compared to my, my 20 something of then, um, he has considerably more life experience. And I realized that the scene as I had heard it was a 20 something year old woman's idea of how an old man would view a situation. And there was no integrity, there was no truth. It was as close as I could get. Uh, and my, the way I'd structured it, it, it worked within the piece, but there was no honesty in it. And so I said to John Wright, tell me the story. We didn't rehearse it any further. Um, tell me the story. We're gonna go straight into recording with the orchestra. You sing, I will accompany your story. Here are the places we need to connect because it's important for the structure of the work. Uh, but otherwise, you tell your story and, and we, will, we will help you share that. And it was the most amazing you know, experience for me at that time, walking in and just, I, I didn't look at the score. I didn't even look at the orchestra terribly much. We'd rehearsed it with the orchestra. Uh, John and I just stared each other down and it was the most fantastic one take of, of a scene, which is rare in live recording. Um, oh, and wow. that's, what, that's what's on the CD. Um, so it was, it was really special. So I think if you can find every, every great singer has an honesty that we don't necessarily understand uh, unless we look for it, unless we're open to it. So if you can find the honesty uh, in the singer and find a way to let their soul speak to the audience in a way we we have to kind of I see it a little bit as that there's sort of a, a facilitating and an uplifting but with a little protection from what could go wrong um, and I think if that is what you have in mind you're going to have a successful performance with young singers they may need a little bit more guidance to help them find the truth. They may not have found their honesty yet. Um, but unless you're dealing with the individual human beings um, and, and their souls, um, again, it won't work. It just won't. That's such a gorgeous way of thinking about actually putting things together. Also, it feels, it feels like you're both showing humility and also co a collaborative spirit, which I think I really... I, I personally really applaud as a way to work because it feels like everyone then has ownership of what they're creating as well. Um, turning to your kind of more regular work as well, you're obviously very much immersed in Wagner a lot of the time and, and we're set up to do it, Italian opera, which is a little bit different, but obviously Wagner and Verdi, the great rivals, but who didn't ever really refer to each other or anything. Um, what do you think the main differences are between conducting something like Wagner and uh, something like Verdi? How, how would you change the way that you, you worked? Uh, I, I don't. Um, the language is as important, um, which I think is the, is the main actually oral difference. The colors are different. It's, diff it's different depictions of the same scene. It's like different painters painting the same landscape and painting the same image you need to convey, or you need to see that image at the end. You need to present that image. It may look completely different, but the essence of the landscape must still be there. Um, for example, there is very little difference in energy in the storm scene at the beginning of Otello and the storm scene at the beginning of The Flying Dutchman. Um, the only difference really there, I mean, it's completely different scoring, it's completely different orally, but when you're conducting it, the only difference is that the storm in Otello is over quite quickly and is leading to triumph. Um, it's overcome quickly and, and, and Otello returns the hero. And in The Flying Dutchman, it, the same storm has been raging for eternity and your conquering hero is such, isn't so much a hero, he's very, very tired and he's done with life. So you have to convey in that storm uh, the, the essence of the exhaustion of the title character in an Otello storm, the essence of leading into triumph. Um, Weather-wise, it's the same storm. <laughs> I love that. Um, so also thinking about 
opera and the score as well. I, I trained as a classical musician, so we did a lot about kind of how we were, we were trying to follow through different authenticity and intentions and stuff like that. And, and in a way, sometimes the score can sometimes feel more restrictive than, you know, just being given a, a new set of paint. So we're always trying to kind of create and paint something new. How do you think opera and music can make itself relevant to, to modern audiences, maybe without the staging aspect? I think uh, a lot of people find the staging helpful because we're so used to being a visual society now with television and film. Um, I don't think anyone realizes how effective music can be in the telling of a story. Um, if you watch the world's most terrifying horror films and you turn the sound down, they're not remotely scary, never. You could, you could put a, a five-year-old in front of the most terrifying horror film. There is no suspense if you can't hear the music. Uh, it just doesn't exist. And so I think if you isolate that uh, and look at, at the musical side of things, everything is told, everything is there. And if you close your eyes and visualize, everyone has their own visuals. I think automatically we visualize everything that we, that we hear. There's always a picture in your mind. Um, and so I think essentially it's the soundtrack. Uh, it's the soundtrack for these stories. Uh, and all of these stories are relevant. Um, there's, that's the beautiful thing. Everyone says, you know, how can we keep opera relevant? How can we, how can we update it? These are people. Um, and I say it's possibly because I, I got into opera at a very, very early age. I was six when I went to see my first, my first. Oh, wow. And so I, I literally have grown up watching opera singers do what they do and watching them present these stories. Um, these, these characters, it, they're real people. They're incredibly well portrayed. Opera ca characters are frequently better portrayed than most film or, or novel characters. Um, so in the same way that you can lose yourself uh, or find yourself reflected and society reflected in film, TV, novels, it's exactly the same in opera. It doesn't matter what they're wearing, when it was from, these people are people. Um, and the stories may be allegories, um, but the human emotion is more apparent in opera, I think, than pretty much anything else, any other form. Um, and I think that's overlooked a lot of the time. It's seen as such a grand art form and you have to understand the foreign language and understand the music. You don't, you don't at all. You just need to look at, look at the people on stage as people as, and understand their truth. And it comes back to how to present opera. If you present the, the truth and the honesty of a soul, um, then, then you've, you've got it. And music, without any staging, without any, any uh, drama, any visual, is exactly that, just in oral form. Wow. Um, thinking of your own interest as well then, so if offered the opportunity to direct any opera, what would you choose? Direct or conduct? Conduct. I've gone, into, <laughs> I've gone totally into stage I'm, mode. I'm rubbish with visuals. Um, <laughs> There, that's a really difficult question because there are certain pieces I would like to do with certain people. Um, it's, there are certain pieces that I would like to present, but if you gave me uh, particular singers that I would love to work with and share their truths and people that I, I respect and work well with, uh, something, a piece I don't necessarily like terribly much or I don't think I like, could turn out to be the most extraordinary piece of music if you find the truth. Um, and so I think, I think that would change very, very drastically if you told me who was, who was involved. Um, as a conductor, I don't have any way of making sound myself. I have to rely on the instruments that I'm, I'm given. And, and learn and learn how to play them. Uh, and so it's w without knowing which instruments, it's almost impossible to say which piece. Having said that, I am a sucker for all of the big Strauss and Wagner operas, all of the Verdi. Um, when I'm uh, on the treadmill, I run to the Falstaff fugue. 
Um, <laughs> I love that. Fantastic energy. Um, so uh, that's you know that that's a good that's a good pace for for getting things going. So I love I love all of that. Um, Mozart is intricate and clever and so much about humanity. Um, it, it's really it's a really tricky. A tricky question but it would very much in, uh, be determined by which instruments you were going to give me to oh, the fucking beautiful way of thinking of it actually um so just to finish off with well not so much a question but one little bit of a, maybe advice for us because obviously we're quite a new festival we're launching next year with uh that next year this next year yes next year i'm i'm getting confused about what year we're stuck in at the moment yes we're launching with uh Vespa it's still, it's we're still doing 2020 kind of... unfortunately yeah <laughs> We're doing a gala version of that and a kind of um, a kind of work in progress of Roberta Devereux. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say for a, a company that, you know, the Opera Canal, we do see a lot of the same pieces, the Bohems and the Barbara Seville's being repeated. How can we encourage an audience to come and see something that they might not have considered before in terms of, especially with Italian repertoire? Um, I think there's such a wide variety of Italian repertoire that you have, you can create a fantastic festival with variety. So there, there will be something for everyone. Um, but I think presenting opera as not this art form, as I said, it's, it's presenting it as simply a really good movie, but live, so it's better, um, is in fact what, if once people have seen it, once people have come, uh, and experience that um, then and learn to appreciate the characters um, and learn to appreciate the story uh, and at the moment I think everyone's thinking more about life and what's important and who we are and our relationships um, what what is what is really really worthwhile in life uh, and I think those questions can almost be answered a little bit, or we might be able to see some of ourselves uh, going to a live performance. Brilliant. Well, fingers crossed we all get back to it at some yes. point in, in the future. Very soon. Very permitting soon. A, a, a kind of darker winter for us all, but thank you so much, uh, thank you Jen, so much for, for doing me. this and for speaking so passionately and in such a warm way about conducting and and the, i lo just love the kind of collaborative and team way that you work so yeah thank you so thank much you. thank you ella valentina julia and jennifer and thanks to all of our viewers joining us i'm delighted to announce that on december 21st the opera festival chicago will present a live digital presentation of giacomo puccini's el tabaro starring tenor alan glassman soprano Jenny Schuler and baritone Franco Pomponi. Music director Emanuele Andrizzi, artistic director Ella Marchmint, accompanist Alyssa Arrigo, and the entire cast and crew look forward to bringing this special production to you. For more information, please be sure to subscribe to our mailing list on our website, www.operafestivalchicago.org. And on November 21st, Emanuele sits down with opera historian Roger Pines to take you behind the scenes to explore what to expect in El Tabaro. On behalf of the entire Opera Festival Chicago family, thank you again for joining us.